Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. This is going to be a review of episode 7 of Watchmen. It will be in the good, the bad, and the ugly format. Uh, this is actually another character study episode where we see the upbringing of Angela. Um, I was really glad that we got to delve into some of Angela's backstory and to actually see her as a child. I was curious about if we were going to get into that, and I thought it was really interesting that they basically used her detoxing off of her grandfather's memories as a way to sort of show us that. Unfortunately for me, this was another episode where uh, some of the writing fell flat. There is a twist at the end that I have a lot of problems with, which I'm going to get to um, in the bad and the ugly, of course. But first things first, the good. Uh, in this episode, Angela is detoxing from taking her grandfather's nostalgia, which is causing her to vividly relive her own memories in addition to her grandfather's. Uh, and this is used as a plot device to finally get us up to speed on Sister Knight's past, which I really liked. The episode opens with uh, Dr. Manhattan uh, propo, like a propaganda piece that catches us up on how America won the Vietnam War, making Vietnam the 51st state in an occupied territory. We see Angela growing up as a young black girl in Vietnam where there is a lot of rightful hostility towards the American occupiers who now live there. I do find it interesting that this concept was explored in this episode because to me it showed how black Americans are often put in this really weird space um, of attempting to utilize American infrastructure like military um, and police uh, to become upwardly mobile, but that basically puts us squarely in the middle of imperialism that ultimately harms us in the long run. So I appreciated seeing that sort of play out uh, on screen. We meet her parents. We learn that her father doesn't like masks. Uh, we know as the audience that this is because of his experience with his father, who is hooded justice. Uh, and since she now has her grandfather's memories, there's a lot of context and comparisons made uh, between the events that happened in both of their lives, Angela's life as well as Will's life, which to me is a truly brilliant concept of exploring intergenerational trauma, which has been brought up on the show before, but you can kind of see the ripple effect immediately of how certain events and decisions that started with Will's own parents, Angela's great-grandparents, made their way down to Angela via this sort of um, intergenerational trauma being handed down. I thought that was a really, this seems like this is a reoccurring theme uh, on the Watchmen show, and I think that it's something that's not talked about enough, so I'm really glad, again, that this is something that's being played out um, on, on the show, I think it's a really, really smart choice, and they're going about it in a really smart way. Uh, Angela's parents died in a terrorist bomb attack that appeared to be a form of protest against the American occupation. There's also a clear comparison made um, of Dr. Manhattan subjugating the Vietnamese to the KKK, subjugating the Black Americans in Tulsa. We see Will's memories of the KKK destroying Black Wall Street in Tulsa sort of overlaid with this puppet show of Dr. Manhattan destroying Vietnamese forces um, because the, the memories are sort of all bleeding together, which Lady True says is a side effect of taking nostalgia that you can vividly experience your, re-experience your own memories along with the memories of the person that you took, and it can become hard to tell like where you end and where that person begins, which I also feel like, again, is part of this reoccurring theme about family and about things that are handed down throughout families, and especially trauma as something that is handed down. Um, she also sees visions of 7K or, you know, the KKK and a bicyclist being uh, handed off a package from the puppet master. This package ends up being the bomb uh, that then detonates killing her parents. And we see all of this and it's, 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 it's very surreal because we are at the same time still experiencing what almost comes across as like psychic echoes of Will's memories. But there's very interesting imagery about domestic terrorism and about people being subjugated along with throwing out these ideas about who is the good guy versus who is the bad guy. You know, we, we have this setup that Dr. Manhattan is seen as a good guy, but this is also really reminiscent of my email just went off, sorry. But this is also really reminiscent of Lori Blake's joke on how superheroes and vigilantes think that they're doing the right thing, but they are actually not. So Angela wakes up at Lady True's after taking the nostalgia. 
Uh, since Lady True is the one that made the drug, she's the one that's helping with the antidote, essentially. Of course, she's the one that makes the drug, and of course, she's the one that's making the antidote. She gives Angela this sort of internal explanation of what happened uh, after she took the nostalgia and how the antidote is flushing it out of her system via a natural host. It's basically like a fucking infomercial plays in her brain. It was very Black Mirror. It was very The Singularity Cometh. Like, it was cool, but it was also fucking creepy. Like, Lady True runs all this like pharmaceutical shit and she's using it in like a very creepy way because again it feels very realistic like something that could occur within our time frame. I also feel like Lady True's use of um, biotech like bi biological technology in comparison to the way that we see some of the biotech being used um, at the, the Greenwood Cultural Center for example where Angela traces her, her um, family tree. I do feel like Lady True's use of the biotech is deliberately being made a little bit more menacing, a little bit more far-reaching, a little bit more terrifying, because we also see that she's definitely like a fucking sociopath, right? We also find out that Blake, uh, Lori Blake, recorded all the stuff that Angela was saying while she was on Nostalgia, which is unsurprising. So Blake knows that Angela's grandfather was the original Hooded Justice and that he's the one that killed the chief. She goes to see the chief's wife and tells her that Will Reeves killed her husband and that he was Hooded Justice. She also makes this statement that I really liked. White men in masks are heroes and black men in masks are scary. Great line. Really like that line. Um, Blake asks uh, the chief's wife about Cyclops and race cult mind control, stating that Reeves believed that her husband was a part of Cyclops and that's why he killed him. Uh, and it's basically confirmed that 7K is Cyclops by another name, which I figured. Surprise, surprise. The wife is in on it and she drops Blake into a hole like motherfucking Bugs Bunny. For some reason, it seemed like they were going almost for a fucking, like, a comedic tone to that scene. She tries to, like, get her with this, um remote and like the remote doesn't work and Blake is like what the fuck are you doing I don't know the tone of that was really weird and I felt like since the remote didn't work Blake had mad time to get up I don't know the tone of that was weird to me not enough to put it in the bad section but I kind of feel like I didn't know exactly what they were going for with that if you guys feel like I'm missing something feel free to let me know in the comments but yeah basically 7k Cyclops um they get Lori Blake, they capture her, similar to how they captured Wade. They're setting traps for people to sort of get them out of the way before whatever this event is that they're they're trying to do in the next few days. Uh, Joe Keen is just like totally out of the racist closet. Seconds, but seconds feel like Silk Spectre. Something I like about her personality is that she's just like so pragmatic. Like she's tired of the games with these people. She's over mass superheroes. She's over mass cops. She's over everything. Like Joe has this whole long ass monologue about how it's so hard being a white man. I kind of feel like Lori represents the audience during this scene because she's just in there looking at him like, oh, okay. Joe has this long ass monologue about how it's so hard being a white man and how they're not racist. They just want to tip the balance back in their favor, which literally made me fucking bust out laughing while I was watching it. Like I was just waiting for him to be like, yeah, this is about states rights. That saying when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. When you've received all types of help and cookies from the government to get ahead and then the government gives somebody else a cookie, you get mad and say it's not fair and the scales are being tipped against you and all this other stuff. Shit that really happens in real life, they're putting in the show, they're not dancing around a lot of these types of issues. And I am going to say that, you know, watching the show up until now, I feel like this is one of the strongest points of the show. This is where the show is at its strongest, when it's using a lot of real world examples and sort of flipping them for the show. That is when the show is at its absolute strongest for me. Like these scenes were very strong. They were very well written. We find out that Joe pretty much manufactured the whole thing down to the 7k attack on the cops so that he could become the leader of both factions and eventually become president and the chief and his wife were in on it only now they're aiming for bigger and better things dun 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 they're trying to replicate the accident that turned john into dr manhattan so that they can basically all become gods big reveal there
We also learned about what inspired Angela to become a cop, which was a mix of two main influences, uh, the first being a black exploitation tape that she wanted as a child in Vietnam called Sister Night, of course, which is about a black woman vigilante uh, fighting crime that uh, Angela gravitated towards as a child in Vietnam because it was a, it was a, a black face, right? It was a, a black woman similar to her. This is like an echo, again, of the, ba the Bass Reeves film that her grandfather watched over and over that made him inspired, you know, to have a sense of justice. Again, we're getting into these sort of psychic echoes and these ripples through our time uh, and throughout generations. The second influence that led to her becoming a cop was Vietnamese police that came to talk to her about what she saw when her parents got killed. Uh, we see her relive the memory where she identified her parents' killer and it bleeds into her grandfather's memories. After she identified the bomber, the Vietnamese lady cop gave her a badge and said, you know, when you grow up, come see me, which bled into her grandfather becoming a cop and uh, his cadet, you know, um, ceremony and also his becoming hooded justice so just again experiencing her and her grandfather's memories at the same time and just experiencing these waves of um this event led to this event which led to that event which led to that event right we also see it uh play out for a very different reason with lady true's daughter who's having dreams that she's an old woman whose feet hurt obviously this leads you to believe that she took someone's nostalgia I thought Lady True was just giving her daughter um, her mother's memories in order to keep them alive because she said like how she built this whole terrarium because she promised her mother she would never leave Vietnam. Turns out her daughter is not actually her daughter. She is her mother who she has cloned and recreated. Again, Lady True using this biotech in a very fucking creepy way. We've already seen her create biological, you know, humans before when she made that baby um, during her introduction. So it's not that much of a surprise to see that she cloned and recreated her own mom. But it's fucking weird as fuck. Like, she's, she talks about how it's 12 hours until the millennium clock is activated and she wants her mother there for what she's calling the culmination of her life's work. So she has cloned her mom and is raising her. Uh, I also wonder if the clone is on some type of accelerated aging timetable. I hope that's mentioned at some point, or is she just aging normally? She's also slowly feeding her mother slash daughter her own memories back via a nostalgia IV drip. I feel like Lady True's mom and her memories are going to end up having some significance here um, because it's just, it's been mentioned more than once, it's been mentioned twice, and Lady True is Vietnamese, and we have this whole backstory about, like, Angela being from Vietnam and this, like, forced American occupation. I don't know. I just think this is all going to end up having, I hope it does, uh, some type of personal significance to Angela's family. I'm interested in seeing where this uh, goes. Um, I think that Lady True is supposed to be sociopathic, fucking genius billionaire. Obviously, there's like a clear Adrian Veidt parallel as well, like a sociopathic genius billionaire who would destroy the world to save it type thing, right? Um, I'm very curious to see what this fucking clock does. Is it going to just bring him back? Is it going to open up another fake portal into another fake dimension for another fake attack? Like, obviously, they're leaving it deliberately vague, so we won't find out until the last hour. But there's there are some clear parallels being drawn um, with Lady True's character. Near the end, we see that she actually has Angela hooked up to a fucking elephant for her flush detox, because elephants have great memories, I guess. I don't know. That seemed like another kind of, like, wait, wait, nudge, nudge joke, which there were a lot of those in this episode. Angela pulls the plug and experiences another memory. After her parents' death, she goes to live in an orphanage where the orphanage lady is so mean, which I think we're supposed to infer is because she's an American kid, so she doesn't want her there. So again, this is another example of this hostile American occupation. Angela's grandmother, June, who we met in Will's episode, came to get her, but unfortunately fucking dies right when she's supposed to take her home I was literally like damn little girl Angela has the worst luck in the world um but the memory that she does have of meeting her grandmother and talking to her and going to sit with her in a restaurant and learning about the past um is a good memory right and her grandmother explained how she became estranged from Angela's father after he decided to fight in the Vietnam War and stay in the new state you know because of opportunity and Angela explains to her grandmother that she, when she grows up she's going to be a police officer 
her and she shows her the badge that the lady cop gave her along with the sister night hero tape you know and we just see that they have this connection that unfortunately was cut really short by her grandmother's untimely death and there's just something really wonderful to me about the fact that she ultimately did get to see and know her grandmother that she met as a child through the memories of Will Reeves like imagine just experiencing all these different levels of memory and you know like Angela already had a, a real memory um, from her childhood of her father not liking heroes right and then she had another memory of her grandma explaining that her father didn't like superhero vigilantes because a man in a mask scared him right and now she also has her grandfather's memories as well as the man in the mask just exploring again these levels of the things that happen to us and the people around us and the way that the things play out in our lives that writing was excellent and i really do commend the way that they played that out so after she unplugs herself from the elephant uh she finds a big empty dark room with a globe and lady true's compound or whatever she touches the globe and she sees the blue phone booth conversations of people talking to dr manhattan including laurie blake this is because lady true owns and operates the dr manhattan fucking booths because of course she does the bitch owns everything uh and lady true also stated that he isn't even listening because dr manhattan doesn't care about petty human lives which is something that we've seen reiterated over and over again that as dr manhattan sort of transformed from a human into this godlike figure he cared less and less about like petty human shit um and she also reveals that he's not even listening because he's not even on mars he's hiding in tulsa pretending to be human and that 7k is trying to capture dr manhattan and then create another one which we obviously already know because joe keen has already revealed this to us so the big reveal here though is that dr manhattan is cal uh, Angela's husband she rushes home to bash him over the head with a hammer and pull something blue out um, Lady True well before she rushes home to bash him over the head and pull something blue out Lady True and Angela have a conversation about Cal being in an accident which we've heard about this accident before that caused total amnesia they left Saigon after that and came back to Tulsa because the PD was hiring and she wanted to go home this harkens back to a conversation that she had with her grandmother about like Tulsa is where we are from um but yeah the end is basically the reveal that cal the amnesia was like faked it was staged um that angela and dr manhattan decided to do that so that they could be together for a little while with him as like a human whatever whatever okay i'm just gonna use that to get into the bad even though really that's gonna end up being the ugly because I hated that re you know what I hated that reveal so I'm actually going to get into that in the ugly so let me just the bad this was an episode that I feel had some filler scenes and also an over reliance on plot devices Watchmen has been very clever with the writing to get us from point A to point B and there was also a lot of really good writing in this episode as we sort of explored Angela's family dynamics but outside of Angela's family dynamics there was a lot of stuff that seemed like it existed solely because the plot deemed it so not because any of it actually made any sense there is a scene where Cal tries to come see Angela at Lady True's compound and they won't let him see her or talk to her I feel like this scene was totally filler just to reintroduce Cal's presence in the episode because of what is revealed at the end uh there's also a scene of the little girl giving Angela an emotion test for a dissertation where she asks her all these questions about why she's a cop strictly so we could see Angela's memory of identifying the man who killed her parents and also to introduce the certainty that Bian is also taking nostalgia we also learned that Wade killed five of the 7K members when they came to his house uh, at the end of his episode, episode five, but that he is missing. Fine, that was info we needed to know, but the way that we know was that the dude Pete, I don't even really remember if that's his name, I think it's, it's Pete, the dude that's been working with Lori Blake. There was a lot of like, I'm just gonna say there was a lot of pulling shit out of thin air to suit the plot. We haven't seen the dude Pete or whatever the fuck his name is that's supposed to be assisting Lori in a while. I kind of thought maybe he had went home or something, but then he popped up at the crime scene of Wade's house to explain to us like what happened. They essentially use him, I feel, when Lori needs to be in two places at once, which is kind of lazy, or when we need to have some type of like explanation given. Like Lori, the dude, and Angela are riding in the car and Lori's like, oh, tell Angela, tell her all about my history. Like, you're a fan. And then he, like, tells about the history. We need somebody to fucking be at Wade's house 
even though Lori is talking to the chief's wife, right? So here he comes popping up again, right? Like, I don't know. I feel like that's lazy. He literally only pops up as a plot device when we need some information and then he disappears again. That's lazy writing. I don't really care for that. I don't really care for his character. I feel like he is pointless. He's just a plot device. Also, a lot of you guys have said that you feel the Ozymandias stuff is slow, and I'm starting to agree. We're seven episodes in, and it's dragging. Even in this episode, we see him on trial for trying to escape whatever this pocket universe is that he's in. We have no idea who the fucking game warden is who's presiding over the trial. He wears a mask. These clones of his are pretty fucking annoying. It's like, just enlighten us already, right? Like, the clones find him by way, find him guilty by way of little piggy which is fucking ridiculous. They shout guilty at him. We don't really know what happens, but I feel like it's implied that they possibly turned him into the statue that is at Lady True's and he's trapped in there. I'm wondering if the whole universe is contained in the statue and if, again, Lady True is trying to like bust him out in addition to staging her own attack. But I don't know. I really don't care. And honestly, this Ozymandias subpoint is really dragging now and we have learned literally nothing in seven episodes about it except He's somewhere and he's trying to escape. Like, either tell us or don't tell us or drop it. But I, I definitely agree that it is a weak point in the show and it is dragging. So I'm not putting that in the ugly just yet, but it's right on that line if I don't get something, something, something from this subplot. And I think they're wasting Jeremy Irons, who's great in the role. And I really do hate his fucking clones. They're annoying as fuck. So the ugly... I have so many questions about the reveal that Cal is Dr. Manhattan. This is like Buffy the Vampire Slayer level of creating a whole fucking made up person with a backstory out of nowhere. Like one fucking season, uh, Dawn was there, Buffy came back with a sister, and everybody was just acting like she had been there the whole time. And we the viewers were watching like, where the fuck did this little girl come from, right? We ended up getting an explanation at the end, but I'm going to need an ex a really good explanation of how this played out. Dr. Manhattan has godlike powers, so I don't doubt that he could, you know, do it. Um, but I'm going to need a really good explanation as to why. And I'm not buying that it was like the power of love or something, especially considering they have gone out of our way multiple times to tell us how Dr. Manhattan is like nonchalant and uncaring about the plight of humanity. I really hope they don't expect me to believe that like the power of love cause them to fucking make this whole sham and this whole fabrication. People in Tulsa are the people that met them after they quote unquote came from Saigon or whatever. But like, I I, I just, I'm, I'm gonna need a really, really, really good explanation to buy, the, to buy this, like to buy that Cal is Dr. Manhattan. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not recall it ever being mentioned before this episode that Cal had complete amnesia. It had been mentioned that he was in an accident, but it seemed like they pulled the amnesia like out in the nick of time to be able to utilize this twist, which feels sloppy and lazy. Again, there was a lot of writing in this episode that relied heavily on like plot devices and things that we've never heard of before and people that we haven't seen in a while just magically popping up to give us an explanation, right? I feel like if Cal was gonna have this importance of being Dr. Manhattan, this total amnesia thing should have been mentioned way earlier in the storyline, and he should have been more than just a secondary figure overall on this show. Like, if he was gonna have this much importance, I wish we had seen him more often so that we could have some more comparisons or, or some more familiarity with his personality. We really haven't even seen Cal that much to even be that super emotionally invested in this sort of bait and switch twist that now he's Dr. Manhattan. I did not care for that twist at all. I will also scream if she beamed Black Manta over the head in order for him to turn into a blue white man for the rest of the show. I will not be feeling it. Like, we gonna have to see what happens and how the rest of these episodes play out because like ever since she took the nostalgia, I feel like I don't know where this is going. <laughs> so we'll see where it goes. There's only a few episodes left. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Food for thought as always. See you guys next time. Peace.